Reread paragraphs 2 and 3. How do the words and phrases that describe the setting impact the tone of the text? In this lesson, you will learn how to identify the tone of a text by analyzing the setting. We've been reading the informational text A Night Battle Over a Week Since by Walt Whitman. It takes place during the Civil War between the Union and Confederate armies. This particular text talks about the battle in Chancellorsville, Virginia on May 12, 1863. Let's review what we already know about tone. We know that the tone is the attitude an author has towards his subject or audience, and is most often conveyed through word choice or the author's point of view. Every written piece is comprised of a central theme or subject matter. For instance, A Night Battle Over a Week Sense is about a specific battle that took place during the Civil War. The manner at which the author approaches this theme or subject matter is the tone. The tone can be formal, informal, appreciative, concerned, disappointed, lighthearted, or any other existing attitude. By discovering the author's feelings towards the theme or subject, it influences the reader's understanding of the topic. So when we are trying to identify the tone, we should follow these three steps. First, reread the text, underlining words and phrases that describe the setting. Then ask yourself what connotations about the setting do these words and phrases convey. And third, ask yourself how does the author feel towards the subject. So reread the paragraphs two and three. How do the words and phrases that describe the setting impact the tone of the text? So I know for this question, I'm focusing my attention on the middle section where Whitman describes the battle in the woods and the camps of the wounded soldiers. We already know there are two settings, the battle in the woods and the nature and night sky. So today I'm going to reread the text underlining words and phrases that describe these settings. But what words should I look for to describe the setting? Well, looking for all types of descriptive words and phrases would be a great start. Okay, I'm going to start by looking at the description of nature in the night sky. The night was very pleasant, at times the moon shining out full and clear, all nature so calm in itself, the early summer grass so rich, and foliage of the trees. So the words and phrases that describe nature and the night sky are pleasant, shining out full and clear, calm, and rich. Now let's look at the description of the battle in the woods. So I continued underlining the words and phrases that describe the setting, and this is what I got. So the words and phrases that describe the battle in the woods are good fellows lying helpless, rattle of muskets, crash of cannon, red lifeblood oozing out from heads or trunks or limbs, burning the dead, flashes of fire, flaring flames of smoke, immense roar, and still the woods on fire. Now I'm going to look at the third paragraph. I'm going to continue looking for words and phrases that describe the battle in the woods. But wait, this paragraph is about the camps of the wounded soldiers. Should I underline descriptions of the soldiers? Well, the setting is uh, in the woods, and the battle that is taking place is in the woods. The soldiers are the people in the woods, so I shouldn't be focusing on their description. I need to remain focused on just the setting and not necessarily the people in the setting. So at this point, I want you to pause the video, and I want you to try to identify the words and phrases that describe the setting in the passage. Okay, before I pull out my notes, I'm noticing all of these dashes. Now, what is the purpose of a dash? Oh yeah, dashes are used to either show an interruption in thought or to emphasize a section of the text. Well, Whitman is not talking to anyone else in the text, so he is not being interrupted. So that means that these dashes are to emphasize the text that is written between them. So a lot of the descriptions written between the dashes are emphasizing the pain of the soldiers and the setting, like the overwhelming smell of smoke. All right, let me pull out my notes about the battle so I can add the details from this paragraph. I noted the odor of the blood in the woods. 
I also underlined the bloody scene and the impalpable perfume of the woods. Impalpable means untouchable. So Whitman is saying that the na natural smell or perfume of the woods is not strong enough to overtake the odor of the blood or the pungent stifling smoke. I did the same thing with the description of the night sky and here are my notes. First, I noted the radiance of the moon, then the heavenly sky, and the buoyant upper oceans. Here, Whitman is comparing the sky to oceans that float in the sky. I also noted the large placid stars. When Whitman uses the word placid to describe the stars, he is saying that they are tranquil. Some other descriptions I underlined include coming silently and languidly. So if the stars are languid, then they are coming out slowly. The final description I underlined was the melancholy draper night above. So, the, so next, I'm going to ask myself, what connotations about the setting do these words and phrases convey? Well, I need to look at my descriptions of the nature and night sky again in order to identify the implied feelings about this setting. Well, when I look at this list, I see a beautiful setting. The sky is clear with the moon lighting up the heavens. I envision a starry night and some wispy clouds that would resemble the waves of the ocean. Now let's look at the descriptions of the battle. So when I'm reviewing these descriptions, I see dead bodies and blood stains on the grass. I see fire and smoke caused by a cannon. The smoke is so thick that I can barely breathe. This setting is completely opposite of the other one. I have no desire to be here, and honestly, it's a pretty scary image. Okay, now that I've identified the connotations that the descriptions of the settings convey, I can now move on to the final step, which is to ask myself, how does the author feel towards the subject? Well, based on the descriptive language of the night sky, I believe that Whitman feels calm and at peace looking up at the sky. He paints a picture of a setting that I would love to see. On the other hand, the descriptive language used to paint a picture of the battle in the woods is horrible. I think Whitman is just as scared by this setting as I am. He doesn't want to be there, and he doesn't offer any hope of escape. So I think he feels miserable and grave when talking about the battlefield. Now, now I've done some good thinking about this part of the text. The last thing I want to do is review the original question. Reread the second and third paragraphs. How do the words and phrases that describe the setting impact the tone of the text? Okay, how should I organize my response? Well, I have two options. I could organize it by paragraph. In other words, I could start by addressing both settings and their tones from one paragraph and then move on to the next paragraph. Or I could organize it by setting. Using this method, I would clump all of the details about one setting first and talk about the tone, and then move on to the next setting and talk about its tone. For clarity, I think it is going to be better for me to organize my response by the setting. At this time, I want you to pause the video to read my answer to the prompt. After reading my answer, press play to resume. So, when we are trying to identify the tone, we should follow these three steps. First, reread the text underlining words and phrases that describe the setting. Then, ask yourself what connotations about the setting do these words and phrases convey? Third, ask yourself how does the author feel towards the subject? In this lesson, you have learned how to identify the tone of a text by analyzing the setting.